Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode. Today, joining me today is Dr. Bradley Campbell, who is an Associate Professor of Sociology at California State University and is also the author of books like The Geometry of, of Genocide and more recently, The Rise of Victimhood Culture. Dr. Bradley, uh, Dr. Campbell, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Ricardo. Oh, it's a real pleasure. So today we're going to focus our conversation on your more recent book, The Rise of Victimhood Culture, which you wrote with Jason Manning, the co-author of it. So um, to begin with, uh, could you please distinguish between the three types of cultures that you talk about in the book, the culture of honor, culture of dignity and culture of victimhood? Yes. Uh, so um, a, a lot of a, a, a previous sociologists, historians, others had written about um, the difference between honor cultures and dignity cultures. And so um, honor cultures, um, like many traditional societies, value um, uh, uh, physical courage or bravery. Um, it's, you know, it becomes a supreme value, and, and having a reputation for courage and bravery becomes important to your social standing, and it, it, this is called honor, right? So honor acts as a kind of moral status in those cultures, and, um, and this ends up meaning that um, you have to respond aggressively to any challenge to your honor, right? So because it, this demonstrates bravery, and um, it could, this can take many forms, and there are different kinds of violence and other things associated with honor cultures. But one thing we talk about a lot is the duel, because this is something that uh, that occurs in, in some honor cultures and is kind of uh, really exemplifies um, th that system of morality, where you have um, someone feels slighted or insulted, and um, and the slight, the insult. Uh, is um, seen as low, having lowered their honor, would lower their esteem in the in, um, in the eyes of others, um, and their standing in society if they let it stand. So they challenge someone to a duel. The other person accepts too, because not to accept the duel if if uh, uh, if it's from somebody who is of the right social standing is also dishonorable, right? So um, so that uh, and they end up you know firing guns at each other or fighting with swords or whatever. Often. Um, a, you know, a person dies in the duel, and this is something that can seem kind of absurd to um, to uh, people in, in the modern modern West looking at it. You know, like um, you know, it, it, it seems um, so um, reckless, wasteful. Um, you know, all these kinds of things. Like, what you know, what do you gain? You know, how does it prove that I'm not um, a liar or whatever I've been <laughs> been uh, uh, slurred as? If by going and, and shooting a gun at someone, right? Like, and but but the idea is that you've established your physical uh, courage that, um, and this is the, the supreme value in society, and you're um, and you're uh, and you're demonstrating that you belong, um, um, uh, that you have this kind of social status. So so the duel we, we see it in honor cultures, um, and other kinds of violence too. Uh, honor cultures. In honor cultures, you're supposed to um, respond aggressively to certain kinds of insults. Often, this might be insults about um, your your character. It could be insults about the um, sexual virtue of, uh, of, of of women in the family. Um, all, all kinds of things like this. It can take other kinds of forms besides the duel. Other kinds of fighting, but um, and then also people end up being very sensitive to slight. So you have this idea like you respond aggressively to slight. You also end up being sensitive to slight, um, quick to perceive yourself as being slighted because you don't want to, you know, simply let something slide and let yourself be put down, and it would look like you're a coward if you um, if you didn't respond. Um, so everything is kind of geared around uh, around this idea of, of not looking cowardly, you know. So cowardice is the opposite of honor here, and, and it's very important to be perceived as honorable. Um, so um, and then people. Um, You'll also see, so people are sensitive to slight. You'll also see people in these cultures being, uh, uh, um, people who are concerned with their honor being quick to insult others. So kind of going around um, insulting people. It also demonstrates, well, I don't care if they respond. Uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. So you have all these features that kind of go together in these cultures of honor. 
Um, and it's something that might not make sense to outsiders, but it makes sense in the context of, of the culture, especially if you're in a society without strong legal institutions. You need to project um, that you're willing to stand up for yourself, to make sure that you're you're not wrong, that you're not slighted, that you'll respond um, to uh, to attempts to um, to dominate you, um, you know, to to violence, to theft, um, and 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 projecting an image of toughness and and courage. Um, you know, can be effective in doing that, right? So honor cultures make sense, um, but they're all, they also go along with a lot of violence and a lot of conflict, a lot of, uh, of that, that goes along with it. So um, the culture of honor began to change in various places. So in the United States, um, it lasted in um, the American South up until, certainly up until the Civil War, they were still fighting duels and, and certain kinds of, of honor ideas carried over after that. Um, it had already begun to die down in the North um, um, around uh, the, the beginning of the 19th century. So you have, um, I mean, the famous um, duel between um, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr was in, uh, in Alexander Hamilton had been founding father of the United States, Treasury Secretary. Aaron Burr was the sitting vice president of the United States at the time. And Burr kills Hamilton in a duel. That was 1804. But the reaction there um, in, in the North was, um, was very hostile toward Burr, uh, that people thinking of him as a murderer for killing Hamilton, and um, which wasn't what you would expect under the ideals of honor. I mean, he killed Hamilton in a duel, that he, and he challenged him according to the uh, rules. So you can see that the culture was already changing then. Um, the culture that replaced it is what many historians, um, sociologists have called a culture of dignity. So the sociologist Peter Berger, um, who, who, who died uh, recently, has written um, about all kinds of subjects. One of um, his, uh, uh, a well-known article was called On the Obsolescence of the Concept of Honor. And so he was talking about how honor had become obsolete in the modern West, and the thing that had replaced it was, it was dig the idea of dignity. So dignity culture is different from honor culture um, in, in, in every way that, like, that I talked about. Like So uh, the idea of dignity is that um, every human has um, an, an inherent worth. Every every human being has this inherent worth, that, and that can't change. So the fact that people think uh, badly of you or, or insult you doesn't matter. It doesn't change the fact that you have dignity. And the idea is that it, um, dignity comes um, is, is inherent, and you you're supposed to recognize that you have dignity no matter what people say about you. Your social standing isn't is important. Your your reputation becomes less important. So honor is a kind of moral status that you can lose, but d the idea of dignity is something that each person has and you just need to, to, to live according to it, right? Um, and, and so um, so the idea in dignity cultures then is that if you're insulted, you can just ignore it. Uh, so um, it, it, we teach children things like sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Right, that's um, you know, a common you know, refrain to, taught to, to children, but it, it exemplifies dignity culture. The idea that, yes, violence is something that you need to respond to. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words you can ignore. Words won't hurt you, which is completely opposite of the idea of honor culture, which tells you fight back if someone insults you, right? Like uh, you can't let that stand. And the idea in dignity culture is that you're supposed to, to let it stand and you're supposed to not be bothered by it. You're supposed to have thick skin. Um, so that you're not even quick to perceive insults, right? You're not supposed to go around thinking you're you're being slighted all the time, and if people do slight you, just ignore it. Um, so while honor culture says respond to aggression, injury, and insult yourself um, violently, right? You handle those things yourself. You demonstrate um, your bravery. Dignity cultures tell you if you're if there's violence against you or theft, some kind of uh, 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 you know crime. You go to the police. The culture going to the courts to the police is considered dishonorable. You handle things yourself. It looks weak to need a third party to intervene. Dignity cultures say handle those offenses with the law, but you don't handle um, slights and it need to handle slights and insults at all. You can just ignore them. And so this is why Peter Berger said, you know, wrote sort of on the obsolescence of the concept of honor. So that honor had al had really almost become obsolete in modern society. People weren't thinking in the in those terms, even like the law, re in a sense, replaces um, uh, um, 
you know, the, the law intervenes when there's violence, right? So the idea is that, well, instead of handling violence myself, I go to the law. But it's not that way with insults. It actually tells you you have to ignore that. It's not like the law comes in and handles uh, insults against you. So, um, so on the, the, the very offenses that cause lots of conflict, lots of violence in honor society, aren't even considered serious offenses um, in dignity culture. Now, Berger um, was entirely correct. Honor wasn't obsolete. Um, um, it's a, it, it exists uh, um, among uh, street gangs and, uh, and many other people, usually uh, among, more among the, uh, those of lower status in, mo in modern societies. But people um, still respond to insults with aggression and those kinds of things in certain areas. So there are pockets of honor in um, modern society. But mostly, especially among elites, professionals, middle class, is, uh, um, the dignity has replaced honor. Um, now, what we began to notice, though, is that many of the ideals of dignity, such as ignore slights against you, um, you know, violence is very different um, from, um, from insults and words, um, don't be uh, quick to perceive slights and those kinds of things. We, we saw many of those ideas being challenged, especially among um, uh, the, uh, left, the campus left, the activists at universities. So we first started um, thinking about this idea of a microaggression. So um, this is a term that um, I had not heard until of until uh, 2013, um, and most people hadn't heard of it. It's been around since the the 80s, I think. Um, but um, but the idea well the idea of a microaggression is that um, certain kinds of of slights uh, that, that, that particularly people who are racial minorities, women, others who are who are considered to have um, to, uh, to be the, the victims of oppression in modern societies, that they constantly experience what they're calling microaggressions. So they're not the you know it's not the macro or large acts of aggression um, like um, you know overt discrimination things like that. It's um, it's it's ordinary slights and insults. So we began to see these microaggression websites. So um, there was, there were students at universities who had created websites where they could list all of what they called the microaggressions against them, and it would be things like um, well, they, they uh, there was a, a website called Oberlin Microaggression. So at Oberlin College, and and, uh, and one of them was someone complaining because she had been in the gym and heard a professor say, um, oh, I'm glad my husband has blue eyes so that uh, my children will have blue eyes. And, and the student then interprets, you know, interprets that um, as a microaggression and says, I don't want casual racism in my professors. Um, and, and other things like that but that, were, that were, people were taking as um, slights, some of them obvious, you know, sort of obviously um, Awkward statements, at least, or insensitive, and some of them things that uh, really outsiders to the, this culture wouldn't think of as as offenses at all, like the, the blue eyes thing. Um, but um, but these were called microaggressions, and the idea was that it was a a tiny little aggression, right? So in in one sense, you're blurring the distinction between words and and violence, right? By calling this an aggression, this is something that actually harms you know harms people. Um, you know, the old idea of dignity would be you choose whether things harm you or not. Whether you know, you don't. Again, that's why there's a distinction between words and violence. I can't choose whether um, whether the sticks and stones uh, um, directed toward me actually hurt me, but I can choose whether the words hurt me because I have the power of how I respond. But this was uh, the idea here was that these were aggressions, just like other kinds of aggressions, and were actually harming people. They're micro, they called them, but the idea was that um, that micro didn't didn't mean they weren't um, important. That, that, that they built up over time. You know, so like at constantly experiencing these microaggressions would then um, you know, uh, prevent you from succeeding, um, uh, you know, cause depression and all kinds of, of harm. And so this seemed to be a very kind of different idea because you were uh, encouraging people to focus on slights and very minor slights, right? So in, instead of encouraging people to have thick skin like in a dignity culture and brush off slights, they're actually in a kind of compiling lists of them, giving the worst possible interpretation um, to certain statements. 
it, it didn't just seem different from the ideas of dignity culture, but because we had, you know, been teaching about dignity versus honor, both uh, Jason Manning, um, my co-author, and I study violence, and um, and so the you know, um, since honor is so important in a lot of violence, this is something that we had long been uh, uh, reading about and teaching about, and we just noticed that, well, in, in a sense, um, this was like. A, uh, like an honor, like what you'd see in an honor culture, where people were quick to take offense, um, that they're um, they're they're very sensitive to slight, just like a a, a southern gentleman in the early 1800s might be, right? Uh, you know, you, uh, but um, but the difference was, it was a, uh, a big difference is they weren't um, handling it themselves through violence; they were appealing to uh, third parties, right, by publicizing them through microaggression. Um, websites, um, and later on, as we've seen since we, we wrote this, appealing to university administrators to intervene to make it, you know, um, they, they've got microaggression reporting systems at some campuses now, um, student evaluate, uh, some student evaluations um, ask if there have been microaggressions in the class, um, and all these kinds of appeals to like, university administrators and others to do something about it. So in a dignity culture, people appeal to third parties, like the government or others, to intervene if there's violence. There's no shame in that. In an honor culture, the idea is you handle things, but, but you're supposed to, in a dignity culture, brush off slights. In an honor culture, you're sensitive to everything, but you handle it yourself. And so this new culture was combining certain elements of it, uh, uh, sensitivity to slight, certain kinds of slight, uh, and um, appeal to third parties, though. Um, so it, it it wasn't like honor, it wasn't like um, and we ended up calling it culture of victimhood because um, what we also saw is that just as honor is a kind of moral status in an honor society, your reputation for bravery becomes uh, so crucial and so important. Um, victimhood became a kind of moral status um, in this new culture of vic uh, uh, victimhood that was emerging on um, uh, among people in college uh, uh, campuses, so in the culture of victimhood, then um, you uh, people you can drive a kind of status from being seen as a victim, as a member of a, of a, a, a group that's oppressed. And so again, it's not it's it's not that they're concerned with just slights against anybody. Um, it's um, slights against people who are seen as as oppressed and. Um, and, and in various ways, we saw um, the victimhood had become a, a new kind of moral status. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because earlier you referred to the fact that you heard about the term microaggressions back in 2013. And there are many people who refer to the years of 2013, 2014 as something changed, that something changed around there on university campuses, at least in the Anglophone world, I would say, perhaps the US, Canada, and so on. Um, was there any particular set of circumstances or conditions that uh, drove the rise of victimhood culture starting on campuses during that time? Or does victimhood culture have some sort of historical precedent? I think... Um both to some extent, so it all, it's always a matter of degree, um, and uh, and a lot of the trends that we're talking about, and even the trend toward victimhood being a kind of status, um, is is something that's more long term, um, and it's something that exists to some degree in other settings. And so the way we look at it is is that it's um, it's among um, uh, certain campus activists, and especially recently. That you see victimhood in its uh, victimhood culture in its extreme form. Um, the idea of um, so, but, but there's always it's always a matter of degree. So just as honor isn't, you know, it's not as if people think it's good to be cowardly in modern society, right? So so there's still some kind of notion that this is a virtue that that bravery and things like encourage are are virtues. It's just that in what we call cultures of honor. Um, that becomes the dominant virtue, right? And you, uh, it's more important to be perceived as um, as having honor than toward, you know, say being being kind to people, being you know, generous, certain things like that. Although those might also be important. Um, so there is a matter of degree, and I think it's also a matter of degree 
how much status is accorded to victimhood because I think it's people um, will always want to side with victim um, vi with people they perceive as victims uh, against oppressors, right? That's part of like perceiving somebody as being a victim rather than um, uh, uh, that you you, see, you believe that they're being unjustly treated. And so, um, if you side with them in a conflict against the people that you see as as having mistreated them, then um, you're um, you're you're aiding them, right? So it's a kind of being able to attract support, you know, as and you're, you're going to be able to attract support if you're perceived as a victim, is is a kind of um, gives you a kind of status, right? It's the, it's the ability to attract support in a conflict. Um, so there's some degree of that in other other settings, um, and I think that has been increasing over the long term, um, but has it. Um, and, and the concern with oppression um, and uh, and those kinds of things have you know, go back to um, the civil rights movement and things. Now, the the civil rights movement, in the United States, um, was mainly an appeal to dignity, right? So it was um, the the idea was always um, that everybody has this equal worth and and that it's not being realized. So the um, the idea wasn't that the ideals of the culture were wrong; it was that they weren't being practiced, right? So um, but I think like since, um, but following that, um, uh, when, um, that became a model of how to interpret the world, right, that, um, that there were some people being oppressed and other people who were oppressors, um, and then being applied to situations that were not as, um, where there wasn't as kind of the, uh, um, you know, oppression even by the government as there had been in the Jim Crow South um, uh, uh, then um, then you end up uh, developing this framework where uh, of, of seeing um, the world in terms of oppressors and oppressed and all that and, and, and of trying to side with the victims and so if you're trying and, and it's understandable if in conflicts people would, would want to side with the victims but it's sp it, it um, spills over to like um, research and theory you know trying to um, you know, explain things in a way that will never put people who are considered victims in bad in a bad light. Um, you, we see that in sociology and psychology and things like that. So there are, I'd say, for decades there are these kinds of trends of of trying to um, uh, of, uh, of of victimhood becoming a kind of status and it, and, and and a concern um, with it can can even um, you know again I'm not it's not that it's bad or all or it's certainly not all bad. But um, but can distort um, social science research and can and and has other kinds of effects. Now, what happened though um, around 2013 is that um, and for a long time there had been um, these you know these ideas had been um, um, prevalent among um, the far left on campuses. You know so. Like I said, the the term microaggression goes way back, but it was not in the mainstream at all um, on the campuses or, or, or elsewhere. It certainly it wasn't discussed in, um, in, in um, like the mainstream media. It wasn't on campus uh, an issue. It wasn't as if there were um, you know universities were not um, you know doing microaggression training sessions or any of that. So then the question is, well, why did this happen in 2013? Why did some of the ideas that had um, had, had been around among campus activists um, suddenly um, go more mainstream, and, and uh, especially on campuses, but even in, uh, in the outside world? And um, we, we talk about several conditions um, that are favorable to victimhood culture, and some of these had just been building for a, a long time. but um, we would say, um, yeah. So we um, we use the theories of Donald Black, uh, who's um, a sociologist of morality, and um, his work has has normally um, tried to explain how conflicts are handled. So anytime somebody has a moral grievance, um, how do they handle it? Whether it's through law or violence or whatever, um, and um, more recently, he's been trying to uh, understand the conflicts themselves. So, you know, why do people have conflicts in the first place? Where does mor mor where do moral ideas come from? And Black sees all this as the result of social structure, 
But social structure um, in this theory means something very specific. It has to do with the social characteristics, the social relationships of the people in, uh, in, in any kind of behavior. So if it's a conflict, you're like thinking of people in some kind of moral dispute, you'd want to know, like, are they strangers or are they intimates, right? So that would be you know, social characteristics. Are they high in status or low in status? Is one high and one low? Um, the differences in social structure then will lead to differences in the way that conflicts are handled. So, for example, if people are in conflicts with strangers, they're more likely to um, to go to, to 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 use law to call the police to sue than if they're in conflicts with intimates, right? So, our friends and, and family members, um, and that and there are other kinds of propositions too about status and, and other kinds of things. So, the handling of conflict um, depends on social structure. Now, more recently, Black also talked about the source of conflict, and he sees that changes in social structure will lead to conflict in their way. So we can, um, we can think of conflicts as having to do with um, um, intimacy, diversity, or equality. So, you know, not to go in, in too much, but, um, but just like, so something like rape can be uh, considered an act of, uh, of increasing intimacy, a drastic increase, in, uh, a drastic and unwanted increase in intimacy. But some, but like a peeping tom, not as serious, something not as serious as a rape, but also a, a crime and, a, and you know something causes disputes, is also an increase in intimacy, right? You're violating somebody's intimacy. Um, people also have disputes about too little, you know, there being uh, too little intimacy in a situation. You're not, you're, you know, you're not talking with me enough. We're not hanging out enough. Um, and then equality, um, there, it, uh, you, people may see insubordination as an offense. People may see um, may see uh, uh, putting yourself above others as an offense, all the kind of uh, ideas about, you know, um, stealing people's property, you know, changing their status, all kinds of disputes about status. And then diversity. So heresy, um, you know, can be too much diversity in a society, can seen as too much diversity and be a serious offense. But also um, um, I think that attacking someone's culture um, in, in various ways, uh, ethnic slurs, all kinds of things are also offenses. So we can kind of divide um, conflicts into, um, you know, and in having to do with intimacy, quality, or diversity. Now, we were, um, what we saw with um, the victimhood conflicts is that they had to do mainly, like, kind of um, with, uh, overall with um, equality and diversity. They are about, um, they're, they're objecting to, um, things that they perceive as reducing equality, right? increasing inequality between people. Um, and they're objecting to things that they see as putting down one's, uh, someone's culture. So in Black's terms, this was, these were uh, conflicts about, um, about uh, un what he calls under diversity, right? So uh, too little diversity, not, you know, you're uh, putting down my culture, trying to eliminate it. Um, and um, and what, what he calls... Um, then over stratification, like too much stratification, right? You're you're you know putting lowering somebody beneath you. So what they were seeing happening through microaggressions and other things is that people who were uh, low in stat lower in status or were being put put down, um, especially people uh, who had uh, were from certain cultural groups, right? So there were cultural offenses and offenses against equality. So kind of this is so we you know drew from from Black's ideas to try to understand well. When do these things become such serious offenses, right? That even minor acts of, you know, you know, like microaggressions, even minor acts against equality and against diversity would um, be seen as so um, offensive. And what Black says is that um, offense, you know, that um, offenses against equality, right? The idea that you're increasing inequality um, are, you know, especially bad when there's already equality. So we see this in other situations too, like um, among hunter-gatherers and other uh, and people who are very um, equal, they're very sensitive to anyone trying to put themselves above others, right? So um, so there's a lot of work about this. Um, and so where there's more equality, offenses against uh, equality are, are worse. And then where there's more diversity, things like ethnic slurs uh, and those uh, sorts of things. So it, you combine those, equality and diversity, you're going to uh, get a, a concern with even very minor slights. So it was actually, you know, 
I mean, this has been one of the puzzles is like, why are people on, you know, so we first heard about microaggressions coming out of, um, a, a, you know, a, a, a website from Oberlin College. Oberlin College is an extremely progressive place, right? Uh, you know, um, and why were the students at Oberlin College acting as if it were a hotbed of, of racism and oppression, right? This, it seems so bizarre, but it makes sense if you understand, you know, the sociology of morality that they're, of course, going to be concerned with what they see as oppression against minority uh, culture groups because there's so much equality and diversity already um, there among the students, right? So these kinds of... And so we drew... Uh, so, so one reason, then, for the rise of victimhood culture is, um, is the increase in equality and diversity in society and in, in, in these locations specifically. So it's coming out of there. Um, so a greater equality... Greater diversity leads to this. Also, the presence of authority. So, just like you know, honor honor cultures often thrive where there are not stable authorities, like governments and others, to intervene in conflicts, and that's why people tend to turn, you know, um, value um, handling conflicts yourself. Uh, dignity then arose where there there was authority, um, but um, victimhood culture also needs stable authorities, people to appeal to, um, because they're. Um, and so at university campuses, you have that. You have the um, university officials. We have, so, um, you know, you have uh, increasing numbers of administrators um, in, in recent years. So some of these trends have been going on a long time. Some of them are a little more recent. They're actually, um, you know, so uh, um, the, the growth of administration is, is likely a, a, a big part of it. Also, um, modern media technology. So... Um, people were able then, people who wanted to, who, who would be inclined under certain circumstances to perceive um, um, uh, slights, to want to respond to them and want to alert others to them, now had the means to do so. They could go online and create microaggression websites. They can go to Twitter, Tumblr, um, all, the, all these kinds of things. And so um, certainly modern communications made it easier to appeal to third parties. There's also um, the, the fact that um, with, uh, along with the greater um, um, diversity uh, 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 in terms of ethnic diversity and lifestyles and other kinds of things, on college campuses, there's been a decrease in uh, political diversity. You know, so, and, and this is something that has changed. So this is part of part, you know, you know why 2013? This is probably um, one of the reasons for it. Uh, for um, a long time, you know, forever basically, um, university uh, you know, faculty uh, have tended to be more liberal right, than the broader society. That um, has been the case a long time. It's, the case, it's more the case in social sciences than in the natural sciences. Um, but um, what has happened is that just even like just in the last 20 years um, and or, uh, in the last 15 years, it's gone from um, from liberals being kind of um, uh, dominant over uh, over the faculty being overwhelmingly liberal to the faculty being almost exclusively liberal. So if you, I don't remember the numbers now, but if it's, you know, but if it's gone from 70 percent to 95 percent or something in social science faculty, whatever it is. It's a, it's a big difference, right? Um, so faculty um, then um, certainly have, have become much more um, uniformly on the left during this time. So one of the, and this kind of explains one thing that also might seem like a, 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 a bit of a contradiction with um, victimhood culture, is that there is on the one hand, um, this increased uh, sensitivity to slights and, and other kinds of things, and on the other hand, this hostility toward those who are perceived as slighting others, right? So there's, you know, it's, it's like extreme empathy, uh, or a kind of empathy on the one hand, combined with this extreme vindictiveness toward others, right? So um, those who are, are considered oppressors or privileged or, you know, blind to their privilege at least, are, are, are treated with hostility um, and then different groups of people, you know, some, some are accorded victimhood status where um, 
you know, where it may be okay to attack conservatives or, or maybe whites or, or men in certain, you know, in very um, um, vicious terms, right? Um, and, um, you know, almost kind of, um, we see sometimes uh, almost, you know, what we might call hate speech in another uh, yeah, context. There was, you know, an article um, published in, just recently in the, in the Washington Post, I think, of why can't we hate men, right, by, by a feminist. Um, you know, it's almost literally hate speech. I mean, or, or literally hate speech. Uh, you know, it's talking about hating them. So, um, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt uh, uh, published an, um, an article in The Atlantic in, in 2015 um, called The Coddling of the American Mind. Lukianoff is the director of, uh, of this uh, FIRE, a Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education that defends free speech on campuses. Haidt is a uh, uh, a, a social psychologist, uh, a psychologist of morality, uh, um, wrote um, the, uh, the Righteous Mind, uh, extremely uh, influential book, and um, they talked about something they called um, vindictive protectiveness. Right, so it was um, so it's kind of combining those aspects of, on one hand, protecting, trying to you know protect the people seen as victims on campus, but being um, very vindictive toward those who were seen as oppressing them. And now, it, and it is kind of, it makes sense if you put it that way, but it is kind of contradiction, especially when you're talking about minor and unintentional slights, like microaggressions, right? I mean, they're, they're acknowledged to be minor, even on, and they don't have to even be intentional. And yet, um, and yet the, the idea is that, that, that um, there, there, there's, you know, um, hostility to directed toward, um, toward those who engage in them. Um, and that, and so you're combining this extra sensitivity and empathy with some to with hostility for others. And so, if you remember back, though, uh, you know, to you know, what I was talking about before, the idea that um, that uh, offenses um, against diversity are greatest when there's a lot of diversity, um, but increases in too much diversity is greatest when there um, is little diversity. So, in 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 traditional societies where there was very, you know. Like little little difference in religious beliefs, for instance, heresy was an ext was was a serious offense. You know? So, but there, um, but but since there are different aspects of culture, it's not an all or nothing thing. Whether he's he's either diversity or not. Like in this case, you have some kinds of diversity, but then not other kinds of diversity. So the fact that you have less political diversity can mean that um, any political diversity you have is seen as heresy. The fact that you're you have more of certain kinds of diversity and inequality means there, there's this concern with people who might be oppressed. And you end up believing then that that those people who diverge from you politically are the ones oppressing people, right? Uh, and so it's, um, you know, diversity in one area and not in another. Um, and, and, you know, black would predict kind of both of these things, right? That you get um, a concern with heresy of a kind and also a concern with... Um, with trying trying to um, you know um, to to put down cultures and, and, and that kind of thing, so the the culture of conservatives isn't one that's privileged and and um, and, and, uh, um, and empathized with in this environment, right? Uh, it, it's um, you know, uh, these other kinds of, of cultural groupings. So these are some of the trends I think, like the um, and greater diversity and equality, especially. Uh, um, but also less diversity politically among uh, faculty administrators, um, media technologies, and um, and and authorities. The, the, the rise of uh, high numbers of campus administrators intervening in all kinds of aspects of, of students' lives. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's interesting that you touch there on the on trying to establish a parallel between victimhood culture and religion because. It's also sort of a religious attitude, right? Because, I mean, we have, for example, original sin because people that are born uh, with a certain gender, with a certain race that come from a, cer from a certain ethnic group and so on, uh, they divide them in the perpetrators and the victims or the oppressors and the victims. So, uh, and they also have sort of persecutions to, <laughs> to the people they consider the oppressors. And they have the devotees and blasphemers. <laughs> and they, and, and in certain, at least in certain courses, they also have sort of uh, 
an index librorum prohibitorum because they tell yeah. people that they shouldn't read certain things and so on. So it really seems like a kind of religion, right? Yeah, um, this is something um, John McWhorter, the, the linguist at, um, at, uh, at Columbia U University, um, has, um, has written some, some stuff about uh, comparing kind of um, the, the campus activist culture to religion. I think it has, it, it certainly has these kinds of parallels. I mean, just, um, I, I think like one thing is that um, I, I think, well, religion um, and, uh, and social science too, actually, you know, science will both have, um, what they do have, in, uh, one thing they have in common, um, you know, despite all the differences, is often seeing the world in a, in a way that differs from common sense. Um, so you're giving these new interpretations to things. Um, and, um, and I think, uh, and so the, um, the victimhood, cult, the, the, you know, the, the extreme victimhood culture of the campus activists has all this kind of, of language and concepts, right, that, that differ um, so much from um, the way we common, you know, people have commonly thought of things, right? Words are, racism means something different, right? Uh, uh, all kinds of things. So um, it's, uh, it's similar in that way. Social science also, you know, will use its own, own uh, uh, um, terminology and stuff. And of course, the difference is that social science, though, is not um, moralistic, right? That it's it, the idea, is, it, you know, you know, you 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 do want to often look at the um, world at, through different kinds of lenses, and and uh, and the way we talk about conflict. I mean, the way we talk about conflicts, for instance, is 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 different um, from the way people normally do, right? Like, well, you know, conflict is caused by um, you know too much or too little um, intimacy or equality or diversity, but. Um, but ultimately, you're trying to to, to explain uh, things, and, and you know, and and, if, and, and, and ideally, um, in, in a way that would be would be testable and, and refutable. Um, so I think, um, I think what it is, what vic victim culture is, is is it's a political and moral ideology, um, and and so that it certainly then has that in common with with. Uh, religious belief, but so does something like Marxism or other kinds of political ideologies of the past, and you know, again, in using their own language and interpretations. So we talk about things like, I mean, I think you're right, like there's, there's, a, there's a kind of original sin, which is uh, oppression, right, that's everywhere, that you, um, you uh, are, you know, they even, um, you know, one of the, the things that we've seen is, is the, the concern with, um, uh, it, you know the idea that that um, that racism isn't something that is is simply you know a, a behavior or a, 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 that you can engage in or not or an ideology that you can reject or not, but that you're um, but that uh, you, um, uh, you know, but that there's this unconscious bias that you have to address, right? So. It, it it really is like like something like original sin, right? That you're it's just it's somehow it's part of all of us, whether we know it or not, um, and um, and we have to you know we have to have some kinds of techniques to overcome it. Um, so and I think what it, about the the different kinds of language and stuff. Um, one of the things you'll see from the activist uh, is you know I mentioned people you know. Um, slurring men or, or whites uh, uh, and so on and what they would they what they would say though is that you can't be sexist against men or you can't be racist against whites but and this is kind of again like a departure from the ordinary way we talk we use these terms right sex you know the idea is sexism it might be that um, you know sexism against women is a bigger problem in society maybe but the idea wasn't ever that sexism could you couldn't be sexist against men or or you know racism um, has historically been directed toward toward, toward blacks and and, um, and minorities in the United States, but the idea wasn't that you literally couldn't be racist against whites. Um, but they're saying even the overt expressions of racism or sexism, expressions of hatred uh, toward uh, toward those groups, can't be racism or sexism because racism or sexism is about institutional power, and um, which is again just a departure from 
um, the way that anybody ha has, you know, people, people normally use the term, or, or we even saw, you know, in talking about um, censorship on campus, we saw somebody defending campus censorship, and they said um, the oppressed, by definition, can't censor their oppressors, right? So even, even censorship is somehow impossible if you're censoring conservatives on campus. It's not, con it's not censorship because, because they're oppressors. So, um, so it's, it really is kind of this, um, um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons we were interested in it, too, is that it seems so baffling to outsiders. I mean, that, and that's including us. Like, what, you know, it was, it's, you know, from a, um, a moral standpoint, a lot of it seems just um, bizarre, you know, what, what is what is happening. And we wanted to try to understand it like, in, in terms of, um, and I think, like, I think this framework, um, you know, can can kind of decode it, right? To try to understand, oh well, that this is the issue is that they see um, they see the world in terms of, of oppression, period, and and that victimhood is a kind of status, and um, whether you um, uh, um, you know, and that you're also seeing in terms of groups, some are, are just always um, victims, and some are always oppressors. Um, the very you know, words that we use of the offenses mean something different. Um, that, that that even the smallest slights like microaggressions um, might be harmful. That that words are violence. Liter like they'll say literally violence, not like it's just like violence. But um, but the idea you know that um, that um, you know that a, you know a speech by a conservative on campus, any, anything that they they've deemed racist or, or sexist, uh, would um, would be um, would 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 actually harm students and can't be allowed, right? It, it makes sense if you if you think that these things are actually um, you know physically you know they're actually harming people just like violence does, right? So um, it's not so, it's not a choice of whether to be offended or not, not a choice of uh, whether to be harmed by somebody else's words and beliefs. Um, and it makes sense. Obviously, we don't allow violence on, on, on campus, so why should we allow this? Is the idea. And then I think to um, you know to outsiders. I mean, it's also the way that. Um, and this is kind of a, a thing where it looks like a religion too. Is that if you're talking about something like um, sin, then um, then uh, you know sin can express itself in all kinds of different ways, right? Like. Um, and and you know and the idea of sin it would be um, that it's re, you know it's rebellion against God whether it's then through through uh, theft or or racism or murder or whatever all those are different things but they all are, are sin and so you have this idea here too that like all of what they find wrong is is some kind of oppression right it's it's um, and you'll even so so Charles Murray uh, you know came to um, to Middlebury. And um, you know, was, you know, students were you know sh shutting down the speech, and you know, a professor was attacked, and all this. But one of the things that they were chanting um, was um, "racist, sexist, anti-gay." Charles Murray, go away! Racist, sexist, anti-gay. Um, now, the accusation against Murray was about racism. Um, you know, they they believed that a, a chapter of um, of the Bell Curve, which talked about um, race differences in IQ, um, they, they're characterizing that as racist. But then, so then you think, well, well where did the sexist and anti-gay come from, right? right? And it's become a standard chant. And is it, you know, think like, well, does it just not make any, I mean, did, did the, were these people just uninformed? But I don't think so. I think that to them, um, and this is, you know, uh, um, to them, the idea is that oppressing one group is like oppressing it all. It's all interconnected, this interlocking system of oppression. So if you're on the side of oppression, you know, you are, you're doing all this. So you, you can call Charles Murray racist, sexist, anti-gay because you've deemed him an oppressor, so he's all of those things. And then it even extends to things that are, um, are offensive for some other reason. So people begin to... Um, you know, to um, to to characterize anything that they find offensive as some kind of oppression. Um, we um, 
we were what we've wondered about this um, uh, in in different domains. I mean, something we thought of as as a kind of moral emaciation, um, so that you um, characterize anything that's morally offensive to you as being being a op oppression of some sort. Um, so we were kind of you know in, in thinking about um, well, in thinking about the the Me Too movement, which is um, uh, you know. Uh, it occurred in, in the United States recently. Like a lot of it early on about uh, Harvey Weinstein was, um, was, was you, know, you have somebody who is is sexually harassing a number of women, um, even um, you know accusations of rape, um, groping, exposing yourself in the workplace, kind of intimidating people, all these kinds of. So that's completely understandable as offensive um, with, uh, under you know ordinary kind of uh, um, moral concepts, right? The culture of dignity, anything is, again, it would be appeal to these people aren't being treated with dignity, these women, and we need to, to stop it. Um, but um, then um, you had, um, but then you have like kind of extensions uh, from that. So um, um, as more, you know, more and more men, um, Began to be accused of things. You um, you have um, you have some people accused of what seems like merely uh, um, boorish behavior, maybe uh, um, um, ungentlemanly behavior, but it's then still characterized as oppression. So there was um, the um, the uh, comedian. Um, Azer is, is Azer and Caesar. I'm trying to remember his name exactly, but um, he was um, uh, uh, he there was a, there were, was an accusation of him um, that he had been um, that uh, he had um, you know a, a woman he'd been on a date with, and then you know they'd gone back to his place. And he kept pursuing a sexual encounter with her. She finally left, and and, and she wrote about this and, and called it, um, you know, sexual assault. Um, and again, it, it seems more. Um, it, it it seemed that uh, it, it, all kinds of people could object um, to the behavior, right? Um, that uh, you know, for for all kinds of reasons, right? That he's he's essentially going on a date with someone, a, a first date. And expecting sex, pursuing it when she uh, when she um, and doesn't want it, but um, but there wasn't any kind of uh, even alleged actual what people would call a, an assault, um, and, um, and and it, and it seems like again this kind of extension to calling anything that you you disagree with oppression. Um, so we wondered, um, you know, about that too that. Um, and that would go along with the the idea um, that um, that uh, almost um, you know that it's almost like like a, a you know a religion about about original sin and those kinds of things. And anything wrong here is oppressive. If it's not oppressive, it's not wrong too, right? That, that's the other idea. Um, so people have kind of ordinary moral intuitions, but they have to reinterpret them um, in um, in victim terms. So I think. Um, yeah, I I I, uh, I think that that it, it does have. I mean, it's 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 a political ideology like others. That, that and and I think political ideologies have, have kind of always uh, had um, had, had commonalities with, with with religious ideology too. Mm -hmm. Exactly, uh, and because uh, victimhood culture stems mostly from university and academia, would you say that? Perhaps one of the big historical precursors to it would be postmodernism and also uh, the social conflict theories that were derived and expanded from Marx. Um, yes, I think um, so. One of the things we talk about in the book, we talk a lot about sociology um, because we're sociologists. So, um, and and we've seen. Um, Sociologists, uh, many sociologists, embrace um, what we would think of as a, an ideology of victimhood culture. That that's actually 
you know, ex- explicitly what they do. It's it's not really what is dominant in sociology, though there's some um, borrowing from from the concepts, but it's certainly an element in, in, in classes and stuff. Uh, I think it, it, so. In sociology, we um, we often talk um, about. I mean, it, it's really weird in a, in a sense that we're supposed to be a social science, but we have like a, a course in classical sociological theory, right? You wouldn't like you wouldn't imagine biologists having like a class where they taught Darwin, right? Like it, it's a sort of you know you either either the information is still relevant and it's incorporated into things or not. But sociology is often presented something more like. Um, more like philosophy or, or, or something, and, and we um, have, have traditionally had um, uh, um, this kind of reverence for, for people um, considered the founders of sociology, the classical sociological theorists. How they even became, became the, the classical sociological theorists is, is interesting, too, but because there are other people around in the 1800s writing about sociology. But they're usually um, given as, at least in, since the um, latter part of the 20th century, um, we've talked about the classical sociological theorist as Karl Marx, um, Emil Durkheim, Max Weber. Now, um, you'll still see then um, sociologists kind of appealing to to one of these theorists as their, um, you know, as the, sort of their inspiration, the tradition they're writing in. And if if um, if we were picking one, it would be Durkheim, and <laughs> Durkheim is the is the is the sociologist. Who's actually trying to understand morality from um, so, from a, a sociological, from a scientific perspective? Um, Weber also, you know, sees sociolo- saw sociology as um, as a science, not quite in the same way that Durkheim did. But then you have Marx, who um, was was obviously um, uh, um, putting forth a political ideology uh, as well, and so. Um, those on the, the sociologists who are on the left have, have traditionally been inspired most mostly by Marx. Marx, of course, has a framework for analysis that, that can be used. Um, um, you know, doesn't have to um, be tied necessarily to um, um, to Marx's political ideology, but usually is to some extent, right? With, with variations. And Marx um, was. Um, the uh, founder of what we would call conflict theory, uh, um, and it, it's really it's it's especially brilliant um, coming from Marx because he's inventing the whole framework, right? Um, it's easy then to apply it to other groups, but the idea um, of conflict theory is that um, there is um, you know that that there's a struggle for domination between groups. And so, and usually this takes the form of, of, you know, some group is the oppressor, the other, uh, others are the oppressed. Marx was trying, um, you know, for Marx, it's, it's what's, it's um, this kind of struggle for domination between groups is what's driving historical change. And the groups are classes, you know, so Marx said the history of all hitherto existing societies, the history of class struggles. So it's class struggles that are driving historical change. You have um, one group benefiting at the expense of others. And so whether they were, um, you know, noblemen and slaves or in um, capitalist societies, the uh, bourgeoisie and the proletariat, right, they're, they're in an, an inherent conflict. So um, so the conflict exists, you know, again, kind of um, just by um, the, just by their position in, in society. So, um, so that's Marxism. Now, at, a fir- at first glance, this, you know, the victimhood ideology that we see is completely different from Marxism in, in the sense that it hardly has anything to do with class, right? It's all about um, women, uh, you know, um, being oppressed or, or, or gays or the transgendered or, um, you know, or, or ethnic groups, right? Um, and and that's is what most of the concern ends up being about. Um, but... Um, but there, but I, even prior to this kind of um, the kind of victimhood framework that you're seeing more recently, uh, there were you know um, people had taken Marx's general kind of framework and applied it to other groups. So a lot of forms of feminism were essentially Marxism 
but just replacing a bourgeoisie and proletariat with men and women, right? So the idea then is, well, there's this other thing that's important. It's not class, right? So uh, on the one hand, it's you know it, it comes across as a rejection of Marxism because you're then saying it's gender, not class, right? Or it's race, not class. Um, but it's 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 the framework that uh, of oppression that um, that Marx invented. And I think then more what what's happened more recently is to to rather than to focus on a single one of them, you know, to say, well, well, instead of class, it's gender we should be looking at, or it's race. It's to say that there's an interlocking system of oppression, and uh, you know this has been been um, called a lot of people call this you know in, um, intersectionality theory, right? Uh, um, and but but the idea is that yes, it's it's class, it's race, it's you know, it's all these other things, right? So there, um, but it's it's not even just that there are multiple forms of oppression, like. Uh, like the oppression of, of the transgendered by the cisgendered, or the oppression of, of women by men, and so on, um, the oppression of, of blacks and other racial minorities by whites. It's not even just that there are different forms of oppression. It's as I was talking about before. They're all the same thing. It's an interlocking system of oppression, right? So it's almost as if there's, um, you know, it, it, we've talked about before, it's almost like there's this substance of oppression, like this oppression stuff that's out there, right? And you, it can manifest itself in different ways. I mean, that's uh, kind of uh, not how they would put it, but it, it, it's how it, how it comes across. And so um, I think, like, I don't, um, it can be unhelpful um, to call it uh, cultural Marxism, which a lot of people uh, have done. Um, because then you just you know you you end up having people and we haven't called it that you end up having people say well what does that have to do with Marxism you don't know what you're talking about right um, and uh, and, it, and and which is true right because it's you know um, anyone who is an orthodox Marxist wouldn't see the world this way right they would see uh, um, all these other things as um, manifestations of class conflict right if they're if they're you know so so um, it's not Marxist, really, in, in that sense. But it, it uh, the reason people, you know, call it have called it cultural Marxism is because you are seeing all these um, other forms of oppression, mostly having to do with various kind aspects of culture. Um, you're seeing them in the same way that Marxists would see um, the oppression of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie as being inherent, you know, to the. Um, so, so they would say like. Um, just the fact that there's a division um, uh, between um, male and female is inherently oppressive, or just uh, you know, um, just as class would be inherently oppressive. So gender is oppressive, right? Or uh, or these other things, or the concept of, of race, or, or, or whatever. Um, so that I think is um, is is um, where. Um, yeah, it's the ideology comes in, and um, in sociology, then, and 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 especially in other fields, more than sociology, um, this often is um, kind of um, it, this. I think of this as um, this is sort of the intellectual source of victimhood culture. This is where all these ideas come from. That um, that you can't be racist uh, uh, against racial minorities because that's not racism. Because it's about you know, oppression of one group by another. Um, it would be like saying to them, it would be like saying that the proletariat could exploit the bourgeoisie, right? It's not uh, not possible in, in Marxist terms, right? They wouldn't be uh, proletariat and bourgeoisie anymore, and that's how they view um, men and women and and, and whites and blacks. Um, and I, I think in um, in outside of sociology, um, particularly um, in in women's studies or um, other kinds of ethnic studies and so on, you often see this this framework as as being dominant. There's a lot of it in sociology too, um, um, but um, not not necessarily uh, dominant in the field.